Each kindness makes the world a little better. Those words are from Jacqueline Woodson's acceptance speech at the Astrid Lindgren Memorial, Memorial Award Ceremony and from one of her books. Since watching that acceptance speech, I carry those words with me, as many of the words by Jacqueline Woodson and many of her books. I am so very happy and proud to present to you in a talk with the wonderful Jukiko Duke, Jacqueline Woodson. Hello, everyone, and hello, Jacqueline. Hey, it's so good to be here. It's great to see you. It's such an honor to have you with us. Thank you for joining us today. Jacqueline, you're such a prolific writer. You've written about 30 books, um, everything from picture books to novels for ad adolescents and grown-ups. And we have six books translated into Swedish so far. I understand that you knew already when you were seven that you were going to be a writer. Yes. Now, how, uh, how did, what, 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 what was it that made it mm. so particularly tempting for you to, to write? I, you know, I just, um, I love story. I love being told stories. I love telling stories, making up stories. Um, and I, I love the physical act of writing. I loved writing my name. I love writing words. And it just felt like magic to me. And, um, you know, at that time, people would ask, what do you want to be when you grow up? And people were saying, like, cowboys and princesses and dancers and, and singers and actors. And, and the only thing that I could think of that really brought me this kind of joy was sitting down by myself and and creating stories. So, um, but so what I, did I it? Knew. What did it? Where did it come from? I mean, you had no role model. I did. I had the books. The books were my role models. Um, and my and when you think of um, um, African American traditions, there's a deep and long history of oral tradition, right? Because we weren't allowed to learn to read and write. And so my grandparents were always telling stories. I also grew up in a religious family, so I had all the stories of the Bibles, like and um, of the Bible. Um, and so, so story was essentially all around me all the time. Um, and it wasn't like now where you can meet authors and stuff, but I definitely had um, the, the authors who had written guiding me. In your wonderful, emotionally charged autobiography, Brown Girl Dreaming, which is Brun Flicka Drömmer in Swedish, you write, beautifully about being raised in two cultures, the southern one, but also um, a very uh, dynamic culture in Brooklyn in the 60s. What do you think that belonging to two cultures has meant for you as a writer? It means I have more stories. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I, I think of my um, childhood and young adulthood, it was not this siloed experience, right? It was not just a singular, singular experience. It was an experience that was expansive. And, um, and because of that expansive experience, I was allowed, I was able to see things from many perspectives, right? I grew up Christian and Muslim. I grew up um, in the South and in the North. I grew up, um, you know, in a family that had very little money and a family that my father's family had much more money. Like, so, so I was able to exist in these many worlds. And in um, Brown, Dreaming, Brown Girl Dreaming, what I do is at the very end of the book, I talk about how what, what I figured out in writing that book and writing that memoir was that when you have many worlds, you can, you can choose which one you walk into. And I was able to do that through the characters and write many books and many, from many perspectives because of, uh, because of that. I wonder also if you don't get an extra sensitivity because you have to adopt to two cultures and you have to be, perhaps if not an, another person, you have at least to adopt your way of being. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, what do we call it here? We call it code switching, right? So, you know, I, when I was in my religious 
my family. I was one way when I was with my friends, I was another way. When I was down south, I was one way. When I was in Brooklyn, I was another way. And, uh, and it definitely did allow me to not to see things from many perspectives and, and to gain that um, empathy for many different people because I understood them more deeply. Often I get the feeling that a writer has very much in common with an explorer. You have something that you're interested in and then you have to explore it. What, yeah. makes, you, what makes you interested in something? I mean, what makes you going as a writer? What triggers you? Just the questions. You know, I think the biggest question I ask myself is what if? And um, that what if can be what if this world was different? What if we thought about people in a different way? What if a, a boy walked into a classroom and he was different from everyone in that classroom? What, how would the classroom react? How would it impact him? What if, um, you know, a new girl came into a school and no one wanted to be friends with her? Am I that new girl? Am I that person who doesn't want to be friends with that stranger? And so I be, it begins with asking all of these questions. I think at the end of the day, though, it's for me as a writer who is very committed to social justice and, and people walking through the world safely, the question is, you know, how is this book going to make me a better human being? How is the writing of this book going to make me a better human being? And by extension, make the readers better human beings from reading it and, and and I think that's at the core. That's the um, that's where most of my curiosity lies, and and where most of um, that exploring begins. Like by the end of this book, how will I be different? But at the same time, there's nothing didactic over your literature. It's really, really pure literature. Thank you. And I think that's because the questions are pure. I think that these are the questions that we ask ourselves as young people. And um, if we're committed, we ask ourselves throughout our lives. <laughs> and I think that's what allows them to be timeless and, and why an adult can come to a book that is supposed, you know, that that's written to young people. I don't say for, but to young people, but it's for everybody, right? Um, and, and, and an adult can come to that book and see some part of themselves in it or have some emotion around it. Um, but yeah, didacticism will kill the narrative <laughs> where it's even on the page. And yet very often literature for young for young people and for children are <laughs> extremely didactic. Yes, it's too bad. And I think that's because people don't understand childhood anymore, right? I think they leave childhood and they forget that when we read as young people, we read because we wanted a good story. We wanted an adventure. We wanted to escape. We didn't. We read textbooks to learn <laughs> and we read books to get lost. And and I, I will hear you know, adults say, I want to write a book uh, for kids because I want to teach them. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> that book has already failed because the minute you set out to try to teach a young person something, you've lost them. But let's take um, one of your books that is translated into Swedish as an example, Feathers, Fjärdar mm -hmm. in Swedish. Um, what was the starting point of that story? It's about... It's very much about deafness, but where, mm -hmm. where did it start for you? I would say that book started for me in my own childhood. When I was growing up, there was a boy who was deaf on our block. Um, and he had a number of brothers and sisters. He couldn't talk, he couldn't hear. And at that time, what we called people who couldn't talk and couldn't hear was deaf mute, that he is a deaf mute. <clears throat> and that became the now. Um, and I remember kids making fun of him, kids not understanding. And <clears throat> for me, as a young person, I'm sure I participated in that some. Um, but my memory of it is trying to talk to him, trying to understand 
the inside of his silent world. Um, and, and he would make grunting noises and kids would mimic that. And um, for me, it was the, I thought, wow, he can't hear them mimicking him. And, and that's protection for him, right? But, um, but they, the family moved away. I never knew what happened to that boy. I don't think he went to school because I think at that time, those services weren't offered to poor kids. <clears throat> um, and then when I became an adult, I started um, learning sign language because I really wanted to be able to go into schools where there were deaf kids and, and, and engage with them and read to them and have conversations. Um, but I also thought that there, there weren't books that told that story. And, and especially, you know, the, the Feathers was the first book that had a, a, ca a deaf character um, who was African-American in the history of our literature in this country. I don't know about other countries, but, um, but I really thought that if I'm writing realistic fiction, I want all people to feel safe in that book. And I want to show people in that book. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I studied the language. I, I, at that time I was moving inside a community where there were deaf folks. I learned a lot about the politics of, of deafness and deafness as a community. Um, and I really wanted to bring that to the page. So that's where it started um, in terms of thinking about my own childhood and the experiences of deafness. You know, now you don't say deaf mute, that, that's derogatory. You say deaf with a capital D because we do think of it as a culture um, and, and a gift. And then the, the, when, um, I'm gonna blank on the name, but when the devices came along that allowed deaf people to hear, um, there was a lot of um, tension in the deaf communities because deafness was seen as a gift um, and as part of a community. And then the hearing parents were saying, no, I don't want my kid to be like that because they were saying, I don't want my kid to be unlike me. Um, and also I want my kid to have better opportunities. So, so it, it was interesting in thinking about some of the parallels um, in, in cultures that are minority cultures and, and deafness as a minority culture. So um, I started thinking about that, but I also, one of the books I loved as a kid was The Selfish Giant by Oscar Wilde. And I've read that book so many times. So when I started writing um, Feathers, I wanted to take that kid from The Selfish Giant and put him in New York <laughs> in the 1970s and see what happens. So that's how we got the Jesus boy. And The Selfish Giant, for those who don't know, it's the story of a giant that was selfish, <laughs> obviously, because back in those days, you can you could put the whole story in the title, right? <laughs> um, and he was selfish. And um, eventually he meets this boy um, who changes him. And then the boy disappears. And then the boy and the giant's very lonely. And then the boy comes back and he has wounds on his hands and his feet. And the giant says, who hath dare to wound thee? You know, who has hurt you? And the boy says, nay, says the boy, these are the wounds of love. You let me play in your garden once and now you can play in mine, which is paradise. And, and so the boy is, of course, representing the Christian idea of Jesus. And so when I decided to have this character, I wanted him to walk in a room and begin to get young people to have those conversations about belief, about hope, about the different ways we have hope, um, and about what it means, and about there not being a right way and a wrong way. So, so, that, so really starting to think about all of that from up the perspective of young people. So you have this, this starting point, and how do you, I mean, your writing process, what does it look like? Do you know from the start that a certain story is going to start at one point and end at another, and then in the middle something will happen? Do you know exactly how Not. things are going to develop? Not at all. It's so organic. It's so about having those questions and having ideas of characters and having ideas of spaces and then sitting down and writing and rewriting. Brown Girl Dreaming, 
I probably rewrote about 30 times. You know, it took me three years to figure out what the narrative arc of it was. I knew with Brown Girl Dreaming that I wanted to figure out how I went from being this slow reader um, to this person who's written all of these books to becoming Jacqueline Woodson. And so I went back and started just writing all the memories of my life down. Um, and, and then halfway through the writing, my mom died suddenly. And so then I started researching her life and that became a part of the book. Um, with Feathers, I knew there was going to be a character named the Jesus Boy. I knew that there was going to be a relative who was deaf. Um, and I knew there was going to be a girl asking all kinds of questions and trying to figure out this moment in her life. But that was what it is. <laughs> Uh, and, and it opens with his coming to our classroom that day was the only new thing. Everything else was as it had always been. And so in that opening line, I'm introducing a new world right here. Someone has walked into the classroom and everything's going to change forever. So, um, so that opening line, I think I had. I can't remember now. <laughs> And from that opening line, everything sort of evolves organically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm. And then at some point, I have to start structuring and figuring it out. And sometimes that's when I understand what the ending is. And in Feathers, we have that last moment where Sean is, um, he has his face against the speaker listening to the song Bridge Over Troubled Water. Um, and I knew that when I, when I wrote chapter, I think it's chapter seven, where they're talking about bridges. And, he's, and Sean says, I wish we could build a, world, a bridge from this world to the other world. And, um, and then Franny doesn't understand, you know, he, and he's thinking about deafness. He's like, I'd like to be able to walk in both the hearing world and the deaf world. And, and, um, and Franny's like, what are you talking about? And he says, you already have both worlds. You can walk wherever you want. And so, um, then when I wrote that chapter, I knew at the end it was going to be, a, that song was going to play and Sean was going to be engaging with that song. Um, and then I had to figure out what that song had to do with the rest of it and all of that. So it's just, um, it's, it's building, you know, I always think of it. I don't know if you have in Sweden, the game Jenga, but it's like building the blocks and then, you know, something doesn't work and it falls apart and then you have to <laughs> rebuild and figure it out. I think about your your language, your prose as well. It, I can, when I read you, I can I can identify a Jacqueline Woodson book, of course. But but there are slight differences between the different works of yours. Is it? I mean, is it the theme that sort of decides how you are to write a book, or mm -hmm. and what kind of book it it becomes? I mean, you have you you have. This scale from from um, from children's books to young adult books to uh, novels for grown-ups, mm -hmm. what decides what kind of books come comes out of a certain theme? I think the main thing is how the book comes to me. So if it feels very poetic and visual, I know it's going to be a picture book. Um, when I think of something like Each Kindness, um, and you know, that winter, that I think it's that winter snow fell on everything. Um, and, and I knew that when I wrote that first line, I saw the snow, I saw, um, that moment and I saw the, the story coming, picture books come line by line, right? When you look at some a line, you know, that, that morning the principal walked in, she had a girl with her. She said to us, this is Maya. Maya looked down at the floor. I think I heard her whisper, hello. And I, I'm seeing it just line by line and image by image. And so I know it's much more of a for a lack of a better word, simplistic story. And I know even though the themes are going to be large, the story is going to be um, written to someone younger. Um, when I have huge themes that feel like they're all over the place and far away, that becomes something like Red at the Bone, which I'm writing 
and and diff, diff, different chapters all over the place. Let me tell some of Aubrey's story now. Let me go tell some of Iris's story. Let me tell the mom's story. And eventually they're going to braid together. I know a young person won't be able to follow a timeline like that. So I know, nope, that's not. So, so it's not even the theme of like, that's about a girl who gets pregnant at 15. But then I have a book like The Dear One, which is about a girl who gets pregnant at 15, which is a middle grade young adult book. Um, and the the way that is, is it's, again, the language is very immediate. It's very right there. Someone, the, the um, time scheme is very um, linear. Um, so, so like someone young can follow it more easily. Um, but, but I think of books like canvases with a picture book. I have this very small canvas and it has a lot of detail with a middle grade book. It's just kind of like a moving picture and it's in your face. And then with an adult book, I have this huge canvas and I can travel all over it. And eventually it's going to fill up and come together and be a complete piece. I don't know if that made sense, but that's how I see it. <laughs> It does make sense. It's a very graphic image of, of writing. <laughs> You've been serving as a young people's poet laureate from 2015 to 2017, and you were named the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature by the Library of Congress mm -hmm. uh, for 2018 to 2019. And I was wondering, there's so many here in the audience who are librarians, they are teachers, they are concerned, uh, concerned mothers and fathers who want their children to read. And I was wondering, your best tip for making a reluctant youngster read, what, does, what do we have to do? It's so much harder now, right? Especially yeah. if your young people have phones. Um, what I did and continue to do with my son is um, read to him. You know, I was like, just give me 10 minutes. I just want to read you this passage. <laughs> and, um, and, and also when we're in the cars, in the car, we have audio books on and they're, they're, you know, prisoners of the car. So they have to listen to them. I leave <laughs> books. <laughs> I leave books in their bathroom. And what I'll do is I'll leave a book open to a page that I, and I'll sometimes circle something. And so um, when they're sitting there, they're like, wait a second, well, what's that? So I, it's much harder when they're younger. And it's so important to read to your kids when they're younger. Um, and it's so important for us as adults to model that, to read ourselves. You know, we have... Um, time where there are no um, devices around, like figure out something to do that's not a device. And my son, of course, now at 14, he's like, well, I'm listening to a podcast, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and and so it's it becomes a harder and harder struggle as they get older. But um, have the books accessible, talk about the books. We One thing we did as a family was we had family reading night and then we had family read where we all read the same book and then talked about it. Um, so, what kind of books uh, were you reading? Um, we did um, Watson's Go to Birmingham. We did we did a number of books. We did poetry. We do um, um, sometimes it's an article, um, middle grade books. Um, we did um, um, the graphic novel. Um, Raina Tagelmeier's Smile, because um, they were really into graphic novels. But middle, it, it really spanned. It was sometimes middle grade. It was sometimes a much younger book because it was much faster to read. And even though um, they were older, we say, okay, let's just do a picture book. Like, and, 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 and really interrogate, really talk about the poetry and the language and the characters. Um, and sometimes it was excerpts from adult books. Um, we just did, we just read together a lesson before dying by Ernest Gaines and, and we read it slowly. Um, I really talked about the themes in the book, but, um, and we always have dinner together. We, tr when I'm in town, you know, when I was traveling a lot and thankfully the pandemic allowed us to have a lot more engagement. Um, but that was an interesting book, especially for my son who was 13 and turned 14 reading it because it has a lot of language and he, he, he struggles with reading, um, so um, we would read out loud to him a lot. And, and a book that he thought he was going to hate, he's still talking about. So it, 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 it's so much more work than it was 
five years ago, 10 years ago, before people thought they needed to have their phone everywhere they went, including in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. um, but it is for me as a writer and as a mom, like, I'm just like, I'm going to force this on you. I'm going to make you do this. I'm, <laughs> I'm putting books everywhere and eventually, and I do allow audio books. I'm like, audio books are fine. Um, as long as you're thinking about it and taking it in because I listen to a lot of books too, just because, um, with nonfiction, I can understand, I can uh, see it better, but I do also read a lot. <laughs> And is it working? Are your kids reading? Um, my daughter's in college now, so she's reading for college, and she will read over the She always has a book by her bed, so she does read. Um, and she went through a period where it felt like she wasn't going to be a reader. Um, my son at 14, it's harder because he has a phone. Um, but at <laughs> night, he does. He, he has to put his phone away, and he does read. And because he has to read for school, and there's always a a book of fiction that he's reading, then, um, then he, the muscle is still working, but I would like it to be stronger. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is an issue that many of us recognize yeah. here in the audience as well. Yes, it's hard. Mm -hmm. Poetry is also good. I mean, I, I've got, I've taken to leaving haiku around the house. <laughs> because I'm just like, okay, here, read Richard Wright's haiku. I'm just going to put one on the refrigerator. Good, you've read something. Like, I feel a little bit better. <laughs> Jacqueline, are you writing something at the moment? I am. I'm working on a middle grade book that I'm, I'm not talking about yet because I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, I'm writing a screenplay about Ida B. Wells, who was a, a, a pioneer of um, the anti-lynching movement in the United States in the early 1900s. Um, also, she invented, um, she invented interrogation. Inter 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 I can't think of the word, but she's, she was a journalist and she really um, interrogated people and, and got investigative journalism. She's considered the mom of that. Um, so that's been a struggle. I'm going to go back to working on that after this talk. And um, I have two picture books that are coming. One came out earlier this year and one's coming out in May. So I'm excited about that. So we so. can look forward to a lot of Jacqueline Woodson literature in the future as well. Yeah, and interestingly enough, you know, the one that's coming out in May is called The World Belonged to Us. And when I was in Sweden um, for the Axel Ingrid Award, um, we talked so much about um, her and her, her, um, her desire for young people to play and to remember play. And, and, and this book is a complete inspiration of that because it's all about the games kids played in the... 70s when they just played in the streets and they made up games and and they you, you know at the, the last day of school was just all about the freedom of being able to play all summer long so i'm grateful to Astrid and i'm grateful to sweden for helping me get this book in the world and <laughs> um, we are so grateful that you are writing for us and for thank the world you. thank you so much jacqueline oh, thank you for, for being with me. us a great applause for Jacqueline. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the conference. It was so nice to talk to you. Thank you.